The municipal flag of Jerusalem is based on the flag of Israel. This is a Wikipedia explanation, by the way, of the flag of Israel. You can look it up. It features two horizontal blue stripes reminiscent of the Talit, the Jewish prayer shawl. In the center are Jerusalem's municipal emblem, which consists of a shield with the line of Judah superimposed on a stylized background representing the kotel, flanked on either side with olive branches. The word uh, Yerushalayim, I'm really butchering that. I'm sorry. I, you know, I'm not trying to disrespect the Hebrew language there. I just uh, can't say it. But Jerusalem, okay, is what it means, appears above the shield. A vertical variant is sometimes used during ceremonial functions. In other words, it would be like a little banner or something like that. Kind of like it would be, it would look like this, and the shield would be facing up like this instead of all on its side. The, I originally had both of them hanging straight down, and I thought, no, because I really wanted to you to see the shield here. So that's why I put this one up this way and the, the Israel flag straight down. That's why I did that. But um, the flag was adopted in 1949 following a contest held by the municipal government in, of Jerusalem, which was established by Israel in the western part of the city, it was made the flag of a united Jerusalem following the Six-Day War in 1967. Okay? Um, so there you have the history of this flag. Very, very interesting. So you have, in the flag of Jerusalem, you have a lion of the tribe of Judah. Flanked on either side... By olive branches. Jerusalem up here and the two blue stripes there, if you see a, a Jewish prayer shawl, they'll, they'll have the blue stripes on it. That's what that symbolizes. But then here you have the western wall there, you know, where the temple's going to be rebuilt. So, very interesting symbol. But what about this term, the line of the tribe of Judah? What about that term? Is, does it appear in the Bible? Turn in your Old Testament to the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 5 is where we're going to be going. If you're new to this, uh, the book of Hosea comes right after the book of Daniel. So Hosea chapter 5, verses 9 through 15 is where we're going to read. Okay, it says here, Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke among the tribes of Israel. Have I made known that which shall surely be? The princes of Judah were like them that remove the bound. Therefore, I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. So again, you see this thing of a prophecy back there in the book of Amos. They're, they're being given up to worship the host of heaven. They're, they're doing all kinds of abominations, worshiping false gods. You know, but notice here, it's a very, very interesting thing here in verse 10. Them that remove the bound. If you study the book of Acts, it talks about all nations are of one blood, but then it goes on in the same verse, in Acts chapter 17, it goes on in the same verse to say, and hath set the bounds of their habitation. Hmm. Again, God has chosen the nation of Israel to give to the people of Israel, the, the Jewish people there. And yet, Right now, modern-day Israel is allowing a lot of other people to come in there. I saw a recent article, I'm going to be talking about this in the future, that uh, a bunch of people, uh, Hamitic descent, you know, Africans, black people, and they've gone over to Jerusalem years and years ago. They went over and they're saying that they're the true Jews and, and the Israeli government recognizes them and has given them amnesty and everything and they like live in the southern part of Israel. What's going on? And I'm sure that there are devout Orthodox Jews over there that are saying, hey, this is our land. What are you doing giving this to, to these people? They don't belong here. You know, this is our land. And again, you have the, the government over there in Israel and they're making peace treaties with, you know, the Arabic people and things. And let's give away part of, you know, the Gaza Strip and the Golan Heights and, the, you know, all these different parts of Israel. And they're saying, let's give it away. What are they doing? Right there. The princes of Judah were like them that removed the bound. Instead of saying, we're going to fight, this is our land. It's, well, okay, we can give away some of this land. We can give away some of that land there. And it says, therefore, I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. God's not happy with the 
Israeli government giving away parts of the land that were promised to the Jewish people. And, you know, I'm stuck in a country, you know, I'm stuck here in America, you know, this is where the Lord has me to do my work. I'm stuck here with an idiotic government that's doing all kinds of things that are contrary to the Word of God. It's frustrating at times. So you say, well, what are you going to do about that? I'm going to make sure that my personal relationship with God is right. And it can only be right through Jesus Christ. Okay, that's why I'm a Christian. Okay, not because of my, my it's my national religion or something and I, I was born into it or something. No, 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 no. Personal relationship is what I have with the Lord. But let's continue here. Verse 11. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked after the commandment. Therefore will I be unto Ephraim as a moth, and to the house of Judah as rottenness. When Ephraim saw his sickness, and Judah saw his wound, then went Ephraim to the Assyrian, and sent to King Jerob. Yet could he not heal you, nor cure you of your wound. Or was there going to the politicians? They didn't, go to, they didn't turn to God. Verse 14. Here it gets interesting. For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion and as a young lion to the house of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah? God's saying, I'm going to be like a young lion to the house of Judah? Remember that. It's going to be important. I, even I, will tear and go away. I will take away and none shall rescue him. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction, they will seek me early. The time of Jacob's trouble. And who gets him out of it? Jesus Christ. See, so what's that have to do with the line of the tribe of Judah, Brian? Turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. I mean... I, I understand and I appreciate a lot of things about the Jewish people, about the Orthodox Jewish positions and stuff. And you look and you see Catholicism as Christianity and you see them as bringing in the New Testament and things. They never, they have their own New Testament. Okay, it's an Egyptian New Testament. It's not the New Testament that we as Bible-believing Christians use. This is a Syrian uh, New Testament that underlies this King James Bible. It's not even the same Bible that the Catholics use. They have other books added, the, the Deuterocanonical books, the Apocryphal books and things like this. They have the Septuagint that they use. All that junk, we don't use that, okay? And, you know, I understand, okay, that there's a prejudice, and rightfully so, among the Jewish people. Those that are, you know, those Jews that are over there that are actually, you know, or, or anywhere, you know, not even just in Israel, but if you're in New York or any part of America or any other country, if you're Jewish, I understand why there's a prejudice against Christianity and against the New Testament. I understand that. I appreciate that. But the fact is, get, get a King James Bible sometime and compare Old Testament and New Testament. You'd be shocked some of the stuff that you could learn from it. But let's look here. God's going to appear as a young lion to the house of Judah. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. There's that number seven again. And I saw a strong angel proclaim, proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Hmm. So you have back in the book of Hosea, God saying, because the Jews are such 
they're so wicked right now. I am going to be like the lion of the tribe of Judah, a lion, a young lion to the house of Judah. Revelation chapter 5, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? The lion of the tribe of Judah. Why would Jerusalem depict the lion of the tribe of Judah as their symbol? You say, but, uh, okay, all right, so, uh, all right, you know, okay, yeah, we see a tie into the lion, but what about the two olive branches? Turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. And there was given me a reed unto, like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. Two olive trees. Where do olive branches come from? They come from olive trees, don't they? One, two. <laughs> hmm. Verse 5. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Interesting. Who was the man in the Old Testament that uh, the prophets came to him, That well, the soldiers came to him, and he spoke, and fire came down out of heaven and burned them? Elijah. Verse 6. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Who was that? in the Old Testament, that he prayed and it stopped raining. Elijah. So we know the identity of one of them. How about the other one? And have power over waters to turn them to blood. Who uh, touched the Nile River and it turned to blood? That would be Moses. And to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Who was it in the book of Exodus that uh, was smiting the earth with plagues? Moses. Who are the two witnesses? Boy, it's such a mystery. No, it's not a mystery. It's Moses and Elijah. I'm going to show you the other verses that prove that here as we continue. Verse 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. What do we read? The angel of the bottomless pit, who has his name in Hebrew, Abaddon, and Greek, Apollyon, he's an angel. Angels represented by stars, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. And his number is 603 score and six. You got it yet? That ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Jerusalem. Could Jerusalem be called Sodom and Egypt right now? Yes. Why? First of all, sodomy is quite legal in Jerusalem. So there you have Sodom. And um, they have a false god on their flag. Sodom and Egypt. Interesting how all this stuff ties together. And people want me to believe that this Bible, this King James Bible, was just written by men that had uh, delusional fantasies of religion and they were just small-minded people. You couldn't tie all this stuff together if you just wrote this thing. Some man just wrote this thing. No way. And this stuff is written thousands of years apart from each other. Very interesting. Verse 8. And their dead bodies... Well, we did read that. Sorry. Verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and in half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another 
because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and in half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. There's that seven number again. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Interesting. You say, but uh, I still have some questions. Maybe it, maybe it was Enoch and Elijah that's, that are the two witnesses. Turn to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, verses 2 and 8. Or 2 through 8, excuse me. I'm going to show you that it is definitely without a question... Moses and Elijah, that are the two witnesses. Mark chapter 9, verse 2. And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into an high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Kind of like a star being bright here. Let's look about this. Verse 3. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them... Elias and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus, okay? And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked round about, they saw no man any more, save Jesus only with themselves. I like that little statement there at the end. Save Jesus only. What's it say over in the book of Acts? There's none other name given among men, under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Jesus Christ is the only way that you can be saved. Save Jesus only. Interesting. But you see there that Moses... And Elias there, Elias is Greek coming to English. In the Old Testament, it would be Elijah, Hebrew coming to English. So, But it's the same guy. Moses and Elijah show up there with Jesus, the Mount of Transfiguration. Hmm. Why? The kingdom is there being offered to the Jews. Their king was there. The lion of the tribe of Judah was there. They rejected him and took a false god. And their false gods are going to show up on the earth very soon. Turn next to Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 8. We're going to see the same event here. Okay, and after six days... Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John his brother, and bringeth them up into an high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter, and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. There it is again. Gotta love that. Okay, so you see the same thing there. Again, now let's go to Malachi chapter 4. If you still have some doubts that it's Moses and Elijah. Malachi chapter 4. We're going to read the whole chapter here. There's only six verses. Malachi chapter 4 verse 1. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness 
Arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Now, obviously, the word son there in this verse, before we continue, verse 2 there, the word son is spelled wrong because it's son of righteousness, S-O-N, but it's spelled son because, see, Jesus couldn't be like the sun because the sun is a star. And we know that Jesus couldn't be like a star, could he? Yeah. Why is Jesus called the son of righteousness? The son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings until the day star arise. I will give him the bright morning star. But the nation of Israel has chosen a false star. Hmm. Verse 3. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, the law, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I curse and smite the earth with a curse. Come and Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Excuse me. But notice, Moses, the law. The law of Moses. Elijah the prophet. What are the two biggest authorities for an Orthodox Jew? The law and the prophets. In fact, you can separate the Old Testament into the law and the prophets, basically. There are some other books in there and things too, but I, I realize that. But law and prophets. So what better men to come and testify to the truth of the New Testament than Moses, the law, Elijah the prophets? Hmm. Moses coming down off the mountain. Moses, Moses gets caught up and God sends him right back down. And when he gets down there, they're worshiping the golden calf. They're worshiping a false god. So you have the two olive trees, the two olive branches coming back and testifying of the line of the tribe of Judah. Don't tell me this is just coincidence. You say, well, uh, okay, all right, so we're seeing some of this. What about the city of Jerusalem? Because back in the old or back in the book of Revelation, it's called, you know, Sodom and Egypt. What's, so it's always going to be just ruined. God's never going to do anything with it. Let's see about that. Matthew chapter 5. What does Jesus Christ call the city of Jerusalem? Matthew chapter 5, verse 33 through 35. Oh, that's Mark. I'm wondering, I'm looking down and going, that doesn't sound right. I was trying for papal infallibility that time and it just didn't work out. You know. Matthew chapter 5, I'm in the right book now, verse 33 through 35. Again ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. You know, don't mess around with the host of heaven there and things. You know, heavens. Hmm. Nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Neither by Jerusalem. Why? For it is the city of the great king the lion of the tribe of Judah. Right there. And he's going to set up his temple, by the way. So I believe his temple, the temple that Jesus Christ sets up, will probably be there by the western wall. The Kotal, right there. Interesting. Very interesting. Finally, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 25. You know, I, I have a very strong burden for the nation of Israel, the, the Jewish people, because I know uh, just as I would have, if, if I could have been there at the time when Moses was up in the mountain before he was sent down by God 
to testify to the people that the commandments of God, the Ten Commandments, and they're down there worshiping the golden calf, you know? And I could see that this slaughter's coming if I knew in the future, you know, what the, that their future was going to be a slaughter. I would have tried to warn them. And so that's why I'm doing this video. I'm trying to warn the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. I'm trying to warn you. Um, I, like I said, again, I understand. I believe me, I do. I understand why you have a, a negative attitude towards Christianity, towards the Bible, towards the New Testament. I understand that you've suffered greatly at the hands of Roman Catholicism. Not Christianity. Okay, get that thing uh, straight. It's not Christianity. All right, the Catholics use the term Christian. All right, Adolf Hitler used the term Christian. It's all through his book, uh, Mein Kampf. It's, it's, they steal the terms of, of the Bible and then, you know, to turn you against the Word of God. But understand, the New Testament ties in perfectly with the Old Testament. Okay, they do tie together. And, I mean, it, it's just incredible. I hope you've seen that in this study. But if you're still not convinced and you still say, well, you know, I don't really see this. I don't really want to, you know, I understand that the salvation through Jesus Christ is going to really turn people against me and I, I'm, I just don't want to be a Christian right now and things. There's still a lot of questions I have. Okay, if you do that and you miss the, the catching away of the body of Christ, which is the next big event to happen on the prophetic time scale, you miss that. And you miss the what we would call the rapture. And you go into the time of Jacob's trouble. This is what you're going to have to prepare for, okay? I just want to read this to you because this is New Testament. And if you're, you know, still rejecting, I'm going to tell you a little bit of what Moses and Elijah are going to be telling you, okay, in the future. Now, you will see Moses and Elijah, and they will be over there in the streets of Jerusalem. So, you know, you're going to see that testimony there, and it's a lot better than anything I can put together. Moses and Elijah are going to do a much better job. They're going to be more believed by the Jewish people. But I'm going to show you some of what they're going to tell you. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Okay, it says here, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, and then, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. Now, if you read over in Matthew chapter 24, it talks about before Jesus comes, it says, you know, that the sun and moon are darkened and the stars fall from heaven. Hmm. There's those stars again, that thing with the angels. Verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king, the star, you know, that rises out of, out of uh, Jacob, and the scepter out of Israel. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer, and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, uh, of, of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he also, or then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee in hunger, and or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Now, in that whole passage, did you see anything about faith in Jesus Christ? No. You know why? Because by the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, there won't be any more mystery. 
you will not be able to say, well, I don't really know. I, I can't really say if Jesus was the Messiah or, or you know, does God really exist or whatever. There's not going to be any more mystery by the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. The mystery is complete. book of Revelation chapter 10, I believe it is, says about the mystery of God will be finished at that time. The whole world's going to know that God is real, that God exists. They're going to see him. And when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth and the saints go out and bring all the nations to judgment, and this is the judgment of the nations that you're reading about here, by the way, the separating of the wheat and the tares. A lot of people get that mixed up. They think that that somehow is the rapture or something like this. No, 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 no. No. This judgment here is for those Jews that have made it through and anybody that survives the time of Jacob's trouble. So if you somehow manage to make it through the whole thing when over half the world's population is going to die, by the end of the thing, you're going to know who Jesus Christ is. And the only way that you're going to make it in is by doing good works for other people, helping people. That's what they're being judged for right there. You make it into the, into the millennial kingdom with Jesus Christ as the king through that. You say, well, that doesn't sound too bad. Oh, well, if you want to go through a uh, you know, third world war and if you want to go through rioting and persecuting and, and all kinds of stuff, not being able to buy or sell and all the other things and the, and the man of sin being revealed, the Antichrist that your flag is prophesying. If you want to go through this to get over to here, help yourself. I don't want to. I don't need to see all this proof to believe this King James Bible. I'm getting out early. Okay? I'm going to be leaving before the time of Jacob's trouble. And I've done plenty of studies on that. You know, I still get people trying to refute it, and nobody can. You know, it's been proven time and time again. And uh, I would just, if you are Jewish, you would do very, very well to get out before this guy shows up. The one that your flag is prophesying, showing up. The star, the false god, Remphan, you know, Kiun, Moloch, all these different false deities. And, you know, that's another interesting thing, too. Let me just say this. A lot of these, you say, why, you know, okay, if this is just, if it's all representing the Antichrist, um, why do you have Muslims here that have this Moloch star? Why do you have Roman Catholics here, you know, with it on their temple? Why do you have witches and why do you have Islam and why do you have all these different groups? And there are, there are so many people that have hexagrams, by the way, too. Uh, Amish and Hindus and all these other false groups, all these cults, satanic cults. They all are have somewhere in their designs, their things, they all have hexagrams. Why? If it's just the Antichrist. Well, because the Antichrist is going to be God to all different peoples. He's going to represent each false religion's God. That's why they're all you know, they all have his symbol as part of their system. And believe me, you don't want to go into this time period, into the time of Jacob's trouble, and have this guy show up. All right? Yes, Jesus Christ is coming at the end of the thing, and yes, you could make it through to that time period here in Matthew chapter 25, and yes, you could get into the millennial kingdom, but it's going to be rough. It's going to be very, very rough. You say, but I, I just want to be here to actually physically see Moses and Elijah. You know, the two olive branches there, the two olive trees. I, I will just, if I could just see Moses and Elijah, okay, <laughs> but you're going to have a rough time. If you take the mark of the beast in that time and you worship the beast over here, if you take that, you go to hell. Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 through 11. Okay, you don't get out. There's no, oh, I made a mistake. Oh, I, let me take it back. Uh-uh, no. Once you worship the Antichrist, you're never going to make it over here. It's not going to happen. Okay? I believe a lot of the people that have taken the mark die before this end time thing here of, of you know, the good works and things like that. I, I believe God, when he sees people taking the mark and worshiping the beast, he's just going to have no mercy at all on those people. I mean, you see, read the book of Revelation. I mean, good night. I mean, people, just a third of the people dead. Boom. Just like that. One judgment. A third of all people. Incredible. Just incredible. So that is going to be it for this study. Uh, I've been burdened to put this thing together. Um, 
like I said, I, I support the nation of Israel. And uh, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I pray for the, the Jewish people. Um, because I know that, that prophetically speaking, the word of God is now shifting from there's neither Jew nor Greek. You know, God's no respecter of persons. It's now shifting from that back to the nation of Israel. Israel's coming back on, into the spotlight of, of God's prophetic time table there, his, his plans for the future. And, you know, I wanted to show my support for the nation of Israel, but, you know, I'm like, I'm not flying this flag. This flag here, I actually, these are both actually from Israel. These are, these are the real deal here. Okay, these are, I got these on eBay. They're actually from uh, a seller that these are made in Israel. Okay. And I got this flag. I bought this flag and they sent that one along with it. You know, and so I was like, well, I'll use it for the study and I'm probably going to get rid of this thing or something. I don't want this around. This is the flag of the Antichrist. This is the flag of Jesus Christ coming back and ruling and reigning from the city that's promised to him, Jerusalem, the city of the great king. I recommend that you put your faith in him right now. Don't wait to see all the things that happen over here first and see this guy show up before this one shows up. Because when Jesus Christ shows up, you're going to be dealing with the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He came first as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He came as a Lamb, meek and lowly, to pay for your sins. The sacrificial Lamb, the Passover Lamb. Jesus Christ was sacrificed. He was a perfect sacrifice. His blood was shed to take away your sins. And they're gone. See, in the Old Testament, the sins of the Jewish people could be covered by the sacrifices, the sacrificial system there, the, Le the Levitical priesthood and everything. Your sins could be covered, but they couldn't be taken away until that Lamb of God showed up. That's why in the Old Testament, the Jews that died, the saved, like David and, and you know Abraham, Isaac, Jacob and things, they went down into the earth. They couldn't go directly up to heaven because the blood of the lamb and, and, the, and the animals and things that they were sacrificing, it covered their sins, but it didn't take them away until Jesus Christ showed up. Jesus Christ showed up, and the Bible talks about that he went down to the spirits that were in prison and led captivity captive. You know, he took them out. And again, that's a whole other study. I've done sermons on that. I can't get into that right now. But the point is, those Old Testament saints, they're not down there anymore. After Jesus rises from the dead, the saints of many of the the bodies of many of the saints which slept arose and were actually walking around the city streets of Jerusalem. Interesting. So this is where you want to go. <laughs> Jesus Christ. You don't want to go to this one, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the man whose symbol all the false religions out there are already worshiping. They already have it for thousands of years too, by the way. Why? Because it's an angel of the bottomless pit. Abaddon, Apollyon, that's his symbol. He's represented as a star. And he, he doesn't mind himself being called by other names. The devil was called by many names. Satan, the devil, the dragon, all these different, the serpent. He's called by different names. And so it is with Abaddon. Abaddon says, you can call me Abaddon in Hebrew. You can call me Apollyon in Greek. You can call me Remphan. You can call me Moloch. You can call me Chion. You can call me all these other, Chion, however you say it. You can call me all any kind of god like that. You can worship me in witchcraft. You can worship me in Islam. You can worship me in Catholicism. You can worship me however you want. I'll be all things to all people. You see? That's what the Antichrist is going to be. Not so with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is prophesied and he's going to come back and he's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. He came, as I said, he came first as the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He's coming back as an angry lion. Not an old lion that has arthritis and that can kind of struggles to get up off the ground. A young lion. And it's going to be vicious. If you read in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, when Jesus Christ comes back, he meets the Antichrist army. And what's he do? The Antichrist previously had been attacked, wounded in the head, and he rises from the dead, and people say, 
you know, who was like unto the beast, who was able to make war against him, you know. And Jesus Christ, when he shows up as a lion, he goes and destroys, takes the, the Antichrist and the false prophet, knocks them down in the lake of fire, and then their army that they've gathered, 200 million man army, Jesus Christ slaughters them. 200 million man army against Jesus Christ. And we, the saints, the angels at that point in time, uh, we are the sons of God, the replacement of the angels that fell in the Old Testament. Again, another study, I've talked about that. But Jesus Christ kills that army and we're behind him. And we get to watch the whole thing. And then we follow him down. We go out to gather the nations, judgment of the nations. We just read about that in Matthew chapter 25. It's just, it's an amazing, amazing thing that's coming. And it just it really, I, I had no idea until a few months ago, I didn't even know that this flag existed. I didn't even know about this. Many of you out there are probably going, this is the first time I've ever seen that flag. I, I never heard of this. And it just amazed me how the Lord, in spite of Israel being wicked right now and flying a false flag, God still is able to use this nation for His glory and to show a sign to the Jewish people saying, right there, that's my flag. Of all the flags that are out there in the world, this is one here that represents Jesus Christ and Bible prophecy. Pretty amazing. And, you know, let me just say this, too, to all my brothers and sisters out there in Christ. Uh, I might do another study specifically on this subject of angels being the stars of heaven. Um, but, you know, we get so brainwashed by modern-day science into believing that uh, everything that we see out there in the atmosphere and everything else, the host of heaven there, the, the celestial bodies that are up there, we just think to ourselves, well, it's just all gaseous matters and, and you know, separate solar systems and stuff like this. Um, when, I, when I believe in science, science to me is something that is observable, demonstrable, okay? It's, it's something that can be tested, that can be touched, that can be felt. Somebody says to me, um, that's a nice uh, bowl of jello you have in your hands there, Brian. I can look and I can say, oh, it's not jello. Why? Because it's obviously, it's a book. There's writing, there's pages, it's paper. It's got a leather cover. This is a book. This isn't jello. See, I can scientifically, logically look at this thing and say it's a book. Okay? Now, I look at things and I say, this huge, all these stars out there are just gaseous matter or something like this. How do you know? Well, because the sun is gaseous. Okay, our, our sun here, you know, in our solar system here, okay, our sun is. But aren't you assuming that all the other stars out there, I mean, until you've actually, you know, can actually see them up close and see that that's what they are? How do you know that all the stars out there in the heavens at night, how do you know that they're all actual gaseous matter? Because the Bible plainly teaches that, that some of them are angels. Does it say all the stars in heaven are, are angels? That there aren't any other you know, burning balls of matter? No, it doesn't say that. But there are definitely verses that point to those stars being angels. That's something to think about. Really, really a very fascinating thought. You know, God seems very distant sometimes. And, you know, sometimes your faith starts to get shaken by this wicked satanic world and everything and the oppositions of science falsely so-called, you know, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. You know, you start to doubt. You start to say, oh, I don't know. I want you to think about something. The next time you walk outside at night and you look up and you see those stars, what if those are angels? What if our, our contact with the spirit realm is that close? And the host of heaven is still looking down at us and saying, we're watching, don't worry. I mean, how big is your God? Do you really believe that God can protect you? And I find it interesting too, you know, you say, well, Brother Brian, I can barely even see any stars. Well, the more people gather around, the more people build and build and build, and the bigger the city is, the less you can see the stars. I've been in cities at night and things like that, and you look up, you can't even see stars on a clear night. Why? 
there's so much artificial light. I find it interesting that uh, it seems like the more people, the more sin is in an area, the more they want to see artificial light at night. They don't want to see the stars of heaven. Hmm. And yet I've been in places. I was in uh, northwest Montana the one time. No electricity for miles and miles and miles around. I had a brother that, um, that actually, actually my older brother, not a brother in Christ, but I'm saying my older brother in my family, um, he had some land out there, him and his wife, and they built this cabin, and it was completely off-grid, no electricity other than a generator. And we'd sit out there on the porch at night, and you just look up and you just think, there's, there's so many stars up there in, in heaven, in the heavens, you know, at night. I mean, you just, it's unreal. And you can, you can walk around, you know, at night. There's so much light coming from the heavens. I was in the jungle down in Costa Rica a number of years ago, and uh, down there on a mission trip, and uh, same thing. No electricity for miles and miles and miles around, so there wasn't the light pollution. And you look up at, at night, and it's just, the sky is filled with stars. Now, if at least some of those are angels, shouldn't that make you feel safe? Knowing that the Lord, that's the host of heaven there, and they can protect you? It's really something to think about, isn't it? Like I said, maybe I'll do another study on this in the future or something like that, but uh, rather interesting. And again, you know, I'm not saying you go out and worship them or anything like that. Don't, don't, you know, God gives you up to worship the host of heaven. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, no, no, no. Don't be worshiping angels. That's a bad thing. Worship uh, Jesus Christ. So let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just come to you today, Lord, and, and uh, I just plead with you, Lord, that if there are any Jews out there that are watching this, that you would just speak to their hearts and uh, help them to realize, Lord, that, that yes, they can go into the time of Jacob's trouble, and, and yes, they will be able to see Moses and Elijah, and they will see many signs and wonders that will confirm the New Testament, confirm that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. Uh, yes, that is there. It is available for them in the future, Lord. But uh, salvation in that time is going to be horrible. It's going to be a terrible, terrible thing, Lord, that they're going to see family members killed. It's going to be like the Nazi Holocaust uh, times about 100. And I just uh, really do pray, Lord, that you would just knock on their hearts and, and uh, make them think about salvation right now and getting saved right now and getting that personal relationship with you. And... Um, I know that many of them will have to continue living in a, in a wicked uh, nation, whether it's here in America or even over in Israel. Israel is involved in some very wicked things right now, Lord. The princes of Judah are, are pulling down the bounds and many other things in Israel and doing some very wicked things, Lord. And, and I just uh, I do pray for the Jews over there, Lord, that they would um, Wake up to the reality of what's going on. Wake up to the reality of their flags, Lord, that are prophesying their future. And Lord, I do pray for the body of Christ that, that we would realize and understand and trust your word. When your word says that angels appear as stars, that, that we would believe that and not say that science has somehow disproved that, but that we would believe what your word says about angels and stars and that that would reassure us and give us faith, Lord, that when we look up into the heavens at night that we can know that you are protecting us and that you are watching over us and you have a great uh, multitude, uh, the host of heaven up there, Lord, that, that uh, can rush to our aid and, and, and protect us. And I thank you, Lord, for the protection that you have given to the body of Christ. I know that there are Christians in other countries that do suffer, and um, I understand that, Lord, but uh, I do thank you for... Um, being here and having the opportunity to preach the Word of God and still be able to do this in freedom. And I pray, Lord, that uh, all the members of the body of Christ out there would not take this freedom that we have for granted. Uh, it comes from you, Lord. It doesn't come from the Constitution. It comes from you. And I pray, Lord, that we would all um, redeem the time because the days are evil. And I just uh, pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that's going to be it. Uh, I can honestly say that of many of the studies I've done, this has been one of the most fascinating. I've learned the most. Um, that's 
That's why I like doing ministry because there's, you know, you don't, it isn't just about me teaching and being the know-it-all that teaches everything that I've learned in my years of study. I still study. I still research. I, uh, I'm not always real good at getting messages out in a very rapid time frame because a lot of times I'm doing the study myself. I'm learning new things myself and uh, not really learning new things as discovering old things, things that I just didn't know before. And uh, this this has been a real challenge to me, this study. So I'm going to quit talking, running my mouth here. Uh, just uh, thank you to everybody that prays for the ministry. Uh, we certainly do appreciate that. And uh, I guess that's going to be it. Um, have some interesting studies coming up. We are going to be talking about uh, the Amish. Uh, again, that's another thing that I uh, I grew up around the Amish. Uh, my ancestors were Mennonite, and um, and so I saw a lot of that hypocrisy, the religious uh, traditionalism that overthrows Scripture many times. And uh, my wife and I have been doing extensive research into the Amish, uh, their beliefs, their the past, the um, their connections with Catholicism. Uh, there's a few, quite a few actually. And uh, we're going to be bringing out some interesting information. Um, I'm going to be talking about this in the future, but I really do believe that right now, um, God, as a last act of mercy, is allowing a lot of truth to come out. Uh, truth that has been concealed for centuries, uh, simply because there was no medium for getting truth to anybody out there. Now there is, through the internet. And this very unique, rare time in history um, is definitely allowing um, it's allowing you know Christians to really get the truth out to a lot of people. And the reason for that is because the flight's about ready to leave. Um, the body of Christ is going to get called out soon. And so I believe that this outpouring of truth is that one final invitation from God saying, whosoever will, let him come. And I pray that for everybody out there. If you're lost, if you still don't know for sure where you're going when you die, boy, get it fixed up quickly. You don't want to go and see this guy materialize. The angel of the bottomless pit, the star. Because you see, television, you know, they talk about the stars and things. Television is gearing up to promote the biggest star movie star. Interesting why there's so many videos that present this guy rising up to this level of prominence, being this great warrior, this great soldier, over and over and over and over again in Hollywood. What are they doing? Getting you prepared to receive the star. You know? Get saved. Do it soon.